Hello and good afternoon and welcome to this video tutorial on IPsec and specifically we're going to be taking a look at uh, static virtual tunnel interfaces. So we're going to actually be creating uh, an Ike v1 static virtual tunnel interface configuration and we're going to be configuring an Ike v2 uh, static virtual tunnel interface configuration which is a little different uh, from the uh, if you're doing site to site VPNs. It's a little different than uh, the use of a crypto map. So uh, it used to be that you would go ahead and configure your IPsec uh, settings and then you would create a crypto map and you would apply that map to the interface. And so what we're going to do here, and I'll actually pull up the two uh, use cases. So basically what we have here is three locations that are directly connected to a service provider. Um, however, uh, we're just going to go ahead and say that these are business lines and that the traffic literally uh, is going to hit the internet. So we've got nothing special going on here for our first use case. And I'm actually going to configure these side by side. And so you can see this is going to be the addressing and what we look like here. So we're going to set up a an Ike V1. Uh, static virtual tunnel interface between Santa Rosa, California's router R3 and the Croft and Maryland router R4. For our Ike V2 setup of a static virtual tunnel interface, uh, we're going to be whoops, we're going to be setting up the um, the virtual tunnel uh, interface between the Santa Rosa router. Now you'll notice it's a little different here, right? We're going to be setting it up between router two and router four. However, what do we have here in the middle? Well, we're connected to a service provider, but this is going to be, and this is actually already pre-configured, it's just simply a, an MPLS Layer 3 VPN uh, setup that we have here. So here are our provider edge routers, right? So we've got two different use cases that we're going to be looking at. One of them is you're just simply connected, maybe it's a Verizon business Fios line or a Comcast business line uh, between your two business locations. And then over here, right, you've got a little more uh, complicated configuration, at least from the provider side, where we're doing MPLS Layer 3 VPN. And so again, all of this connectivity here has already been established because we're going to be focusing on the static virtual tunnel interfaces. And again, we're going to talk about some of the differences between Ike V1 and Ike V2. And we're going to look at uh, not only the technical differences, but the configuration differences as well. So let's go ahead and take a step back here. Um, because with IPsec, uh, there's a lot going on. And so uh, one of the things we want to talk about is that IPsec is not just a single technology, right? You can see here that there are a number of RFCs that are related uh, to IPsec. And there's far more uh, than this in terms of all the components and the updates that have taken place. But if you wanted to start out looking, I would start with RFC 2401 through 2412, right? So when we talk about IPsec, and you're going to hear me use this word a lot, framework, right? So IPsec is really a framework, right? If you think about it in terms of it's sort of the overarching description of all of these other technologies that actually go in to making IPsec what it is. So I mean, it's a highly, uh, highly modifiable, highly elastic uh, framework, right, that we can actually add things into. And you'll see here, you know, even from Ike v1, right, to Ike v2, it just simply plugs into the framework. So think of it as this is kind of the umbrella. IPsec is sort of the umbrella, and all of these technologies kind of fall under the IPsec umbrella that allow us to configure our IPsec site-to-site -site VPNs, right? And this is true if we're doing, you know, Flex VPN or Git VPN or DM VPN, or whether it's just, you know, GRE over IPsec or it could be IPsec over GRE. And there is a minor uh, difference there. And so real quickly, um, the, the proper way to describe it is to say GRE over IPsec. And so what that means is, is when we say GRE over IPsec, <clears throat> excuse me, it means that 
Um, IPsec is the transport, right? So IPsec is my transport. And it means that GRE, right, is sort of what gets carried uh, inside. And so with the GRE over IPsec, if we were doing crypto maps, right, if we were creating crypto maps, the crypto map would get applied to the physical interface. So the crypto map equals the physical interface, right? And that's where it gets applied. The opposite of this, and you'll hear people, they sometimes will say, oh yeah, I'm doing IPsec over GRE. Whoops. And you'll see that this is very different because this is saying that GRE is my transport. And with respect to the crypto map, where would you think that that would get applied? So if it's applied for GRE over IPsec, it gets applied at the physical interface. When we're talking about IPsec over GRE, GRE is my transport, right? So the encryption happens first, GRE is second, and so GRE is the transport, and this gets applied to the tunnel interface, right? To that GRE tunnel interface, and we're gonna see this here in a second. So again, this is kind of the, this, I don't wanna say legacy, it's still done today, right? But again, I'll go ahead and we're going to say, we'll go ahead and say legacy, right? Because this, the static virtual tunnel interfaces are sort of the, the predominant way to do things today. And again, based off your use case, and you'll, we'll see that there are still some limitations uh, with the static virtual tunnel interfaces, although the huge benefit of the static virtual tunnel interfaces um, is that they do not need to have GRE involved at all, as we're going to see. So again, right, we've got IPsec, which is sort of this huge umbrella, right? If you think about, I guess, I'll try to draw an umbrella here. Probably not too good of an umbrella. But, um, you know, it's this huge umbrella of technologies that really make up Internet Protocol security. So let's start over here on our left-hand side. You can see that uh, one of the first protocols that's uh, used with IPsec is Ike v one Right, and that's started out in RFC 2409. Now, Ike v1 also includes some protocols, right? And they are Oakley, Scheme, and Isacamp. And you're going to see that used a ton on our right hand side configuration where we're doing the Ike v1 setup, right? And so Isacamp is you know if you consider IPsec the umbrella and then the first sort of tier of protocols right or Ike v1 Ike v2 authentication header and encapsulating security payload Isacamp is also sort of a framework and we really break it down here into uh, and actually it's uh, two phases here that are going to take place. So this is actually phase one, and there's two ways that phase one can go. We'll talk about that in a second. And then ultimately, um, that's going to boil down here to uh, phase two, right? So we've got these different protocols that make up Ike v1, where you've got Isacamp is sort of the, uh, the overarching I don't want to use the word procedure, but it's sort of the overarching framework, again, uh, in which uh, the Ike v1 phases are negotiated. And so if we take a look here, you've got phase one, and phase one can be either main mode or it can be aggressive mode. And the difference between these two is that in main mode, uh, what you're looking at is you'll have an exchange of, I believe it's uh, six packets all together or three exchanges with two packets each for a total of uh, six packets and then if you're doing um, the aggressive mode it obviously uh, cuts down the number of packets uh, that are going to be exchanged right so it really compresses sort of the the security association uh, phases and this is only three packets here in aggressive mode right I believe it's six packets over here 
in main mode. And so that's kind of the difference for the phase one. Now, um, when you do the aggressive mode, uh, you need to be careful because it's going to be there's going to be some information passed. I think it's the identity information of the peers um, or their the responder. There's an initiator and a responder. The responder ID is going to be passed back in clear text. And so that's definitely something uh, to be aware of, right? So we've got these two phases. So this is phase one. And again, phase one kind of breaks down into two different choices, right? You can choose aggressive mode or you can choose main mode. And then when phase one completes, right, we move to phase two. Now remember, let me draw a line down here, go around that guy. Now remember, this Ike V1 is not backwards compatible. I'm sorry, Ike V2 is not backwards compatible with Ike V1. And what I wanted to say was vice versa. Ike V1 is not forward compatible with uh, Ike V2. So you can't have one side of your um, IPsec uh, VPN running Ike V2 and then the other side running Ike V1 and expect uh, that they're going to work. So then you break down into uh, phase two and phase two is just simply called quick mode. And this is where uh, the IPsec Security Association is going to be um, sorted out and established. And so, you know, we talk about phase one and phase two here. In phase one, we're kind of setting up the keying material, right? And we're setting up a tunnel for which the keys can be exchanged securely. And so, this is really, if you want to think about it, you could say that this is kind of the control plane setup of IPsec and again that's kind of a loose 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 use of the term control plane but again you're kind of setting up the parameters uh, that the IPsec negotiation is going to use in order to actually exchange the keying material so that you can therefore set up your phase two security association which is going to be uh, how the data will be encrypted and passed through, right? So up here, phase one, it's all about the keying material and setting up a secure uh, avenue for the keying material to be exchanged. And then phase two, it's all about the data, right? How is the data actually going to be encrypted? And so then we've got Ike V2, right? And this is a really good RFC right here, 7296. Now, one of the interesting things about Ike V2 is it doesn't use, and you'll see this when we go to do the configuration, it doesn't use the word ISACAMP uh, in the configuration, right? It'll refer to pretty much everything as Ike V2. However, it's important to note that uh, Oakley, Scheme, and ISACAMP are still involved with Ike V2, right? Even though you don't hear them called out a lot, uh, they're definitely involved. And so then, the equivalent of what would be phase one over here takes the form of the Ike uh, Security Association initialization and then the Ike authentication, right? And then it moves down into what is kind of the kind of the equivalent of phase two over here is the quick mode, which is create the child um, security association. And then we've got authentication header, right? And we're gonna look more at this here as we move along. And the authentication header is um, simply a way to provide uh, authentication and integrity, right? And so what this basically means is, what is authentication and integrity? Well, it means that if I send a message, and let's say that the message is gonna be 0110, and that message gets sent across the wire, there's gonna be an authentication header check that makes sure that when I receive the information it's 0110 and that it doesn't get changed somewhere in transit, right? So if I were to send uh, 0220 and it shows up as 0330, authentication header um, functionality will give me integrity to say, hey, something's been manipulated here. While this packet was in transit, we're gonna, we're gonna throw this packet away. And then you've got ESP, Encapsulating Security Payload, which is defined in RFC 2406. Now, 
you typically won't see authentication header used uh, a whole lot because it is unsecure, right? Um, unsecure in the sense that there is no confidentiality. And pin is failing me here. No confidentiality. And what does confidentiality mean? Encryption, right? So there's there's no encryption here with authentication header. It's not providing much of anything uh, with respect to confidentiality. Where the encapsulating security payload is providing not only authentication and integrity, but it's also providing the confidentiality via encryption, right? Now, these are not mutually exclusive. I can use some AH settings along with some ESP settings if I wanted to, but again, there's really no need to use authentication header because encapsulating security payload is gonna do everything authentication header is gonna do and it's going to do a little bit more. Okay, so that's kind of just a brief background um, on IPsec, right? And again, we're going to set this up. We're, we're not doing crypto maps. Um, I'm gonna, I'll do a follow-on video with crypto maps, but this is just going to be the static virtual tunnel interfaces because those are really sort of the um, predominant... Uh, framework in which you now set up your site-to-site -site IPsec VPN tunnels uh, and specifically if you're doing DMVPN, right? Because the static virtual tunnel interfaces uh, can be configured with DMVPN, which is an extremely popular um, multi-point uh, solution uh, for um, virtual private networks across whatever the infrastructure may be. All right. So that's our background there. Let's go ahead and jump into the configuration piece here. I'm gonna go ahead and iconify that. So as you can see, and let me pull up, uh, there we go, desk trouble. So as you can see, we've got two different architectures here. This one here, we're just kind of connected into the internet and drag that down. Give me one second here, I apologize. I wanna get the, uh, We'll go with red. So as you can see here, we've got two different architectures. So this one here, we're basically just plugged in to a service provider, nothing special going on, and we're gonna roll out through the service provider's uh, connectivity out to the internet. And then over here, uh, where we're gonna do our Ike v2 configuration, we're gonna be looking at basically layer three, uh, MPLS layer three VPN, right? So here are the customer sites and we're relying upon this provider core. And even though we've got some VRFs, right? We're gonna have a, a VPN routing and forwarding or a virtual routing and forwarding configuration here. We wanna make sure maybe you know we have a higher requirement that we provide confidentiality because MPLS layer three VPN, this is not providing me encryption of any kind, right? Now it's providing me uh, control plane separation and the data plane separation. However, there's no confidentiality of any of that data, right? That I may be sending from Santa Rosa, uh, California over to Crofton, Maryland. All right, so let's go ahead and let me clear that out there. All right, so let's go ahead and let's jump in and let's take a look now. And I may have to refer back to this one with the IP addresses here shortly. All right, so over here on the left hand side this is going to be our Ike v2 setup and on the right hand side we're going to have our Ike v1 setup so let me slide this over here and I'm going to walk do some of the Ike v1 configuration first so again I've got connectivity right or I have connectivity but my use case is I want to make sure that traffic um, and maybe coming off of a LAN segment over here, right? And this could be a small office or whatever, but traffic coming off of my office segment here in Santa Rosa, I wanna make sure that that traffic is encrypted when it goes across the internet and reaches Crofton, Maryland. And it's probably, maybe it's reaching a host back over here behind this router. So let's jump in on the Santa Rosa side first. And we'll go from user exec to privilege exec. I'm gonna go into global config mode. 
And I'm going to go ahead and, again, remember we talked about the two phases, right? Phase one and phase two. So I'm going to go ahead and set up uh, the, the phase one configuration settings here. And we start with our crypto. And this is one of the major differences that we'll see is I refer to Isacamp, right? So remember, Isacamp really isn't doing much of anything other than providing the framework around which Oakley and Scheme are going to do their work with respect to the management of the keys, right? So just like IPsec is sort of this overarching umbrella that has all these individual technologies underneath it that make up IP security, right? Isacamp is kind of the same thing, right? Isacamp is really a framework. And one of the common mistakes is people think that Isacamp is doing the key management, right, for the Security Association, and it is not. Okay, so Isacamp does not do the key management. Okay, the key management is is taken care of o taken care of uh, by Oakley and Scheme. And the key thing to remember is is that Isacamp is more of just sort of the um, you know, it's referred to as the, the Internet Security Association and key uh, management protocol, right? And it, more than anything, it just kind of defines uh, the procedures that need to be um, adhered to when dealing with the keys, right? But it is not a key, it's not doing, it's not a key exchange protocol. That is not what ISACAMP is doing, right? Think of it again uh, as more of a... a definition of the procedures that need to be followed. So I'll say crypto ISACAMP um, policy and again I can pick the policy number here and the key thing to remember with the policy numbers is the lower the number um, if there's multiple policies it's going to look at the uh, lower numbered policies first right it's going to evaluate those first and then work its way up. So I'll just say uh, crypto ISACAMP policy 10 and this is also locally significant. So I'll use 100 over on the other side. So I say Crypto Isacamp Policy 10. So again, remember, we're looking at the Phase 1 configuration information here. And so what do we have as part of Phase 1? Well, let's take a look. So we've got the authentication, right? And that's either going to be pre-shared key or some sort of a, a PKI infrastructure. Um, we have the encryption setting. So what encryption algorithms do we want to use? Uh, to set up the keen material. Then we have the Diffie-Hellman group, right? So we're going to define what Diffie-Hellman group we want to use, and we're going to take a little deeper dive on those because there's some very important information um, about those. And now we have the hashing algorithm, which again, this is providing authentication and integrity of the phase one exchanges, right? And so that's really uh, and you'll see that it's the secure hashing algorithm, SHA, and there's also MD5, and we'll talk about those as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the different options here. So when I say authentication, I do a question mark. You can see that our choices are pre-shared, um, RSA encryption, RSA signature. So we're going to do pre-shared key, which means we're going to configure uh, the actual password uh, that we're going to use between our neighbors. So I say authentication pre-share. The next uh, setting that we looked at is part of phase one, which is protecting our keying material, uh, was the encryption. And so we've got some choices here. We've got DES, AES, and triple DES. Now, DES, data encryption standard, this has been proven uh, to be exploitable and unsecure. Um, triple DES is a little better. However, the best choice of the three will be AES. And we're going to go ahead and pick the maximum setting, which is 256-bit keys, right? All right, so after that, we've got our Diffie-Hellman group. Now, you'll notice we've got a pretty wide selection of groups to choose from here. And this uh, should be, this is definitely a topic of importance when we're talking about the Diffie-Hellman groups. So groups 1, 2, and 5, you'll notice group 1 is 768 bits. And then you've got group 2 at uh, 1,024 bits and group 5 at 1,536 bits. So the key thing to remember here is that groups 1, 2, and 5, 
these are not recommended for use after 2012 by Cisco, right? So we're already almost four years past when you should be using groups one, two, and five. Now, one of the reasons you might, so you're probably asking yourself, well, if, if I'm not supposed to be using those after 2012, why does Cisco include them here? And there's an important um, little caveat, right? Is that if you're only doing, or if you're doing uh, data encryption standard DES or triple DES, right? Then if you look at Diffie Hellman Group One, Diffie Hellman Group One will only support DES or triple DES, right? But it does not support AES. So for whatever reason, if you're using DES or triple DES, then you're going to have to, you you shouldn't have to. But Diffie Hellman Group One will only work with the DES and the triple DES. Now, my recommendation would be to always use the AES with the 256 bits. And when we talk about the Diffie-Hellman groups, right, again, 1, 2, and 5, you should not be using um, since 2012, right? Now, we take a look at the next tier, which is 14, 15, 16, and I don't think 19. Yeah, 14, 15, 16. Um, and these are, uh, you know, 2048, 3072, 4096, respectively. Now, these are recommended to be used only through 2030, right? So 14, you know, 15 more years or 14 and a half more years. And then we've got 19, and I'm not sure why 19, you know, they were able to keep one, 14, 15, 16 together, but not one, two. It looks like it's numerical based off the first digit position here. But again, 19, 20, 21, and 24. Now, these are based off of what's called elliptical curve cryptography. And one of the major benefits of ECC, or the elliptical cryptography protocol, right, is to shorten the length of time needed in order to generate the keys. Now, according to Cisco, the key that you should be using, if it's, I'm sorry, the Diffie-Hellman group that you should be using, if it's available, is 24. This is considered to be the most secure Diffie-Hellman group uh, that you can use. And in addition to that, um, there was something else I was going to say, and I'm, I just completely drew a blank. So yeah, you definitely want to use Diffie-Hellman group 24. Oh, and I'm sorry, because this is considered uh, the what they refer to as longevity of use, right? So if you've got access to group 24, and that might not always be the case, right? So I'm using, real quickly here, if I do a do show version, right, you can see I'm running 15.3 code. Is this any different? I think it's router five here. Let's take a look at router five real quick. And if I were to say um, crypto, oops, sorry, I gotta get into global config here. So we'll go into global config, and this is running 12.4. I always try to keep one of my routers uh, at the 12 branch of code so we can see some differences here. So if I say crypto isocamp policy, oops, sorry, no, profile, policy, and we'll just say 234, and I take a look at the groups, you can see here that this was probably one of the, the last 12.4 releases that was available, and these are Cisco 1841 routers. And you can see here that the 12.4 code, we supported 1, 2, and 5, right? But we did not, or in 141516, but we did not support 19, uh, 20, 21, or 24. Let me make sure I give, give you the right numbers. Yeah, 20, 21, and 24, right? So this could also be a driving factor behind why you might not use 24. Because again, these settings, right, they must match. So when I take a look here, and let's go ahead and did we set our group to 24? We did not. So let me set the group to 24 here real quick. So we'll say group 24 and do show run section isocamp. So here we go. So remember, I said the policy number is locally significant. These settings are not. So these must match. If these do not match between the peers, it's not going to establish or complete phase one of the security association, right? So that may also be a driving factor. Let's say you've got a legacy 1800 series router out there uh, and you know maybe you don't have um, enough space for the 15.3 image 
and you want to run the 12.4 branch, or you are running the 12.4 branch, if I did group 24 here and then tried to set that up with router 5, it's not going to work, right? Because the Diffie-Hellman groups, all of those settings that are part of phase 1 need to match. And so let me pull this up just a little bit here. And let's go back to router 4, which is my Crofton router. All right. So there we go. We've got a couple things left here. So now we're going to do the hash. And as you can see, you've got the uh, MD5 and then you've got the SHA. So both MD5 and, and just the SHA um, by itself there, those are both considered extremely weak, right? So again, if you can support it on both sides, the higher number is typically the better number. And we saw where that may not be the case, right? So here it's only 2,048 bits for group 24, and it's 4,096 bits for group 16. However, this is the recommended uh, group to go with based off the elliptical curve cryptography. And that is the, <coughs> excuse me, let me take a sip of water here. And that is the, um, the longevity of use uh, group that you should be using. Okay, so let's go ahead we've got our hash set now life oops lifetime what does this mean so this is the lifetime that uh, I will wait before I uh, do any kind of uh, rekeying here with the security association and you can see that uh, we can go all the way down to one minute or we can go up to and I'm not mistaken that is 24 hours 86,400 seconds right so if I don't enter anything in here it's going to be the default, and the default is the maximum value. So let's go ahead and just to say we changed it, we'll change it to 43,200, right? So 12 hours. All right, let's take a look at our section. So do show run section, oops, do show run section isocamp. And what do we have here? So there is our crypto isocamp policy 10. AES encryption is going to be 256. We've got our hash. Authentication pre-share our group, and uh, also our Diffie-Hellman group, and <clears throat> excuse me, also our lifetime. So I'm going to type exit out here because there's one more setting that we need to get in here. That's part of phase one. Now remember, we said authentication is pre-shared keys. Okay, so I need to go ahead and define those keys, and you can see again we type in crypto isocamp. You'll notice I'm not typing in crypto Ike v1 policy or crypto Ike v1 key, right? I'm typing in crypto isocamp, and this is one of those things that can be, for new learners, that can be very confusing. You know, if you're telling me I'm using IPsec, why am I typing in isocamp? And if you're telling me that it's, you know, when I type in crypto isocamp, it's Ike v1, why am I not typing in crypto Ike v1? Okay, and that again, that's kind of one of the benefits when we take a look at the Ike v2 setup. It's a little more structured uh, and hierarchical uh, in the way that it looks inside the config, right? It's another advantage of it. It kind of keeps everything sort of in order so that when we look at it, it's like, oh, okay, you know, that makes a little more sense as we read down our configuration. So I'm going to say crypto isocamp key, and I think it's a zero here, and we're going to use an unencrypted key, and we'll just say Juniper, right? Now, I, I can use. Uh, the host name and this is going to be uh, the IP address right of the remote router so again I'm on Santa Rosa 03 here so I'm going to put in uh, the information for the Crofton Maryland router now a common practice with site-to-site uh, -site VPNs is to use in some cases a loopback address however with the use case we have here that you can see on the left, and let me slide this over a little bit more, that you can see on the left, right, I'm not going to be able to push a loopback address out onto the internet, right, because typically, you know, your loopbacks are going to be your RFC 1918s, and in our case here, you can see that they're these 192, 168s. So I'm not going to be able to advertise that out here onto the internet. When we take a look at our uh, MPLS L3 VPN setup, we can do that, right? Because we're kind of functioning across this virtual private network infrastructure that's going to facilitate me advertising between Santa Rosa and Crofton a, uh, a loopback address. 
So I can't do that. So I'm going to have to fully define uh, my peer, right? So I would say crypto isocamp key zero and Juniper, that is the pre-shared key, right? So that's think of it as like the password that's going to facilitate um, the authentication of the peers when they go to do their phase one um, security association. So I'm going to say um, we'll do it by address, right? Because I'm not there's no DNS involved here. So we'll say 209.165.47.4, and I can also put in the subnet mask. So we're going to say 255, 255, 255, and slash 28 is going to be 128, 192, 220, 240. All right. So 225, 225, 225, 240. Okay, so I'm going to do a do show run here. And we'll bring it up to right about there. So now on the right hand side here, and this is on the Santa Rosa router, there is your phase one configuration information, right? I define, and this is again, remember, Phase one is all about securing the exchange of the keying material for, for the, the basic fact is we're trying to make sure um, that we are going to then exchange the keys, right? Exchange our secret keys and be able to then create, based off of that information, a secure IPsec tunnel between the two endpoints, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and iconify that guy. So now let's come over here to, we're going between two and four, I believe. Yeah, so we'll do router two first. Now, on the left-hand side, and let me pull up the diagram for the left-hand side here. So now we're dealing with our, our um, MPLS layer three VPN core. So I'm on the Santa Rosa router here right who's connected into let's say it's a different provider for whatever reason and let's go ahead and take a look at the config and how it differs but then again we're gonna see that you can definitely draw some similarities so Ike v2 here is how Ike v2 is different so we're gonna start out with crypto and that's the first difference that you'll that you're gonna recognize is I don't say crypto isocamp right I say crypto Ike v2 now Ike v2 uh, you think about it, there's a lot of P's involved here, right? So Ike v2, there's going to be a proposal, there's going to be a policy, there's going to be a profile, and we're going to have a key ring, okay? And so when we look at that, those are kind of sort of our 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 um, equivalents of the phase one that we saw earlier over here. And let me scoot this guy up just a little bit more because I'm going to draw in between these two. Okay, so here's our configuration. So I'm gonna say crypto Ike v2 proposal, and I'm just gonna give it a proposal name. So I'm gonna say uh, Travis underscore proposal, right? Now it's nice because you get a message here telling you, you must have at least uh, an encryption algorithm, an integrity algorithm. Remember that authentication integrity is gonna be the hashing algorithm and a Diffie-Hellman group. So it's nice to see this because remember with Ike v1 on the other side we weren't told anything, right? You kind of have to know exactly what you're doing. So I get the proposal entered in here, I do a question mark and again very similar. We've got an encryption setting we're gonna pick from, a group setting and then here they call it integrity, right? And remember when we were over here it wasn't referred to as integrity it was referred to as hash, right? Okay, let me bring this back down. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna do our encryption and we're gonna say AES cipher block chaining and we'll say 256. And then we're gonna go ahead and do our Diffie-Hellman group and you can see 24 is available to us here. And then the integrity, which is gonna be the hash, 512. Oh, and a quick point uh, to mention is that when I enter these in here, um, the initi whoever the initiator is, I could put additional encryptions on here, right? So if I wanted to say 256, 
oops, sorry, if I wanted to say uh, encryption 256, I could then come back and add in um, AES CBC, let's say 128. So if I say do show run section Ike v2, right, you can see that it overwrites what I had in there before, right? So I could pick another encryption, but it's going to overwrite what was previously in there. All right, so then we're going to go back to 256. So let's do that do show run again. Okay, so there we go. So you can see, right, that there are some parallels here. So my encryption over here on this side, okay, and remember this is the totally different setup over here because these guys are going to be doing Ike v1, but Ike v1 encryption, right? Ike v2 has an encryption setting. Ike v2 says I'm going to do integrity SHA-512. Ike v1 says I'm doing hash SHA-512. Same thing for the integrity. Diffie-Hellman group, right? Diffie-Hellman group 24 and then Diffie-Hellman group 24. Okay, so again, it's a little different because we're saying crypto Ike v2 as opposed to crypto isocamp, which again, we're really talking about Ike v1 is our setup over here, but the settings are very similar. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look here on the Ike v2 side. We're going to take a look at the pre shared key and how that's going to get done up. So let me clear the screen here. All right, so <clears throat> excuse me, we've got the encryption, we've got the group, and we've got our Diffie Hellman group, and we've got our um, SHA hash. Uh, authentication, or uh, not authentication, sorry, uh, in, uh, yeah, in integrity, our integrity. Okay, so that's it. That is the Ike v2 proposal. Now we're going to set up our policy. So I'm going to say crypto Ike v2 policy, and I'll just call this Travis underscore policy, right? And again, very nice message telling us, hey, you've got to have at least one complete proposal attached right now remember when it says a proposal attached what proposal do you think it's referring to exactly the one that we just created right Travis underscore proposal so let's take a look at what we've got here so I can exit from this configuration mode but I can match so let's say match and what are my choices so address specific address to match or I could do it off of um, an interface. So if I said match address local address, so this is going to be my local address. Now remember before I said in this setup we have here because this is MPLS layer 3 VPN um, and it's private network for me between Crofton and Santa Rosa so it's already a private network right and I'm in my own little VRF world <coughs> excuse me that what I can do is I can advertise loopback addresses. And so that's actually what I'm doing. So if I come over here to router 4 and I say show IP interface brief, you can see, I'll pull this up in the middle of the screen here, that I have a loopback zero address. Well that address, there's no coincidence, this address is actually being redistributed right through our MPLS L3 VPN core over to router 2. So router two um, also has a loopback address. And if I were to say show IP route, we can see and confirm that it is being advertised. And that's the loopback right there for router two. So what local address am I going to use for router two? Again, it's going to be the 10.20.50.2. Now the key thing here is that you need to make sure that the address is reachable, right? So if I'm using the loopback, it, it better be reachable. So if I were to say ping 10 dot, uh, what is that, 20.50.2, right? So I've got reachability from 4 through this core, right? So from 4, I'm coming through the MPLS core over to the loopback address on router 2. So I'm going to define that as my local address to match. And then I'm going to go ahead and say proposal. So remember, we had to attach a proposal well we just did one because again I'm attaching this because I'm saying that for my policy right remember I've created an Ike v2 policy it's kind of interesting if you think about it right so over here with Ike v1 we say crypto isocamp policy and then I drop in 
all of my settings. Over here, we define a proposal, and then the proposal is attached to the policy, right? So I've got the policy set up now, so then let's go ahead and exit out. And the last thing that we're gonna do as part of the, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of the, um, the setup here is I'm gonna define the key ring, right? So if I were to say crypto Ike v2 key ring, and now the name of the key ring, so I'll just say, whoops, Travis key ring, right? So I can exit, I can say no, or peer, right? So obviously we're gonna be looking at peer and now the name of the peer block, okay? So who is my peer on the other side? Well, I'm just gonna say it's r4.unixunderground.com. And so that's just simply identifying, and you'll see when I do a show run on the section here, you'll see that that's just kind of the human readable format of like, oh, okay, this is gonna be for peer r4 because I could define multiple peers. So I say peer r4.unixunderground.com. Okay, now we drop into another section here. So how do I want to identify my peer? I could do it by address. Um, I'm gonna put a little description in here even, right? Just like on the interfaces, you can put a description. This is kind of the same thing. Um, I could define it by host name. Um, I could use an identity, but I'm just gonna keep it simple. We're gonna use the address, right? And specifically, the loopback address, 10.40.50.4, and we'll put on the subnet mask here. It's a slash 32, right? So in the key ring, we're gonna say uh, also, right, pre-shared key, and I'll simply say zero, and we'll make this one uh, Juniper as well, right? So that is pretty much all we're gonna, oh, I, this will add the description in here, and I'll just say this is the key ring entry for um, router R4. Whoops, router R4. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and exit out. So I'll say do show run section Ike v2. So as you can see, it provides us a little more structure here where we've got the proposal in the name of the proposal, the policy in the name of the policy, the key ring, right, and then the name of the key ring, where we define our peer. I've got my little description in here. Who's What's the address of my peer, and what is my pre-shared key, right? So as you can see, these things are all kind of set up for us just like they were over here as part of the phase one config for Ike v1. But remember where we had to kind of, we dropped in and we did all of the uh, ISACAMP policy configuration settings. And then we actually came out here, identified our peer, right? So where did that get done now? And you can see it's, it's a little more organized. So where I were saying crypto ISACAMP, I put my key and then the address of the peer, right? Where is that now being done? It's being done here as part of the key ring setup. So there's my pre-shared key, there's the address of my peer, and there's just a simple description, and then this identifies uh, my peer in the hierarchy of the configuration, because again, I could, you know, right below this, I could have peer r5.unixunderground.com, and then peer r6.unixunderground.com. So, whereas if I'm doing that over here, right, there's really no hierarchical setup, it's just kind of gonna show up in the config um, as a line by itself when I do the crypto ice camp key, etc. right? So this is just a little better organization on the Ike v2 side, but again, the key thing to remember is here is my phase one stuff, or I just say stuff, my phase one configuration information uh, for Ike v2. And again, you can see it looks a little different than the phase one configuration information that we have over here for Ike v1. Okay, now let me go ahead and clear the screen here and we'll come back over here. All right, so the next thing that we would do uh, on the Ike v2 side is we would set up a profile. However, 
we're going to hold off on that right now. We're going to come back over here to the Ike V1 side, right? And I'm going to finish up the uh, Ike V1 settings. But what I want to do is it's I think it's important to take a look. We'll take a look at some of the debugs, right? So I'm going to say debug crypto and Isacamp. And we're just going to debug crypto Isacamp. Excuse me, not anticipating that we're going to have any errors. Let me check something real quick here. Debug. I don't think there's an Isacamp or just the debug. No. So debug crypto Isacamp. And we're going to see the reaction of the Santa Rosa router after we configure the Crofton side. So again, let me pull this back up real quick here. So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to configure router four, right? And they do have reachability between each other. Let's go ahead and confirm that. So I'm going to say ping 209.165.13.3, right? So you can see I've got connectivity across the internet. So now let's go ahead and we'll step up the pace a little bit here. So I'm going to say crypto isocamp policy. Remember, we're going to pick a random policy number there. So we'll say 24324. And I think I went too big there. The number was too big. Sorry. And in fact, let me... Crypto ISA camp policy. What are my choices? So it's one to I'm sorry, one to ten thousand. That was a hundred thousand. So it's one to ten thousand. And again, that's just the priority of that suite. So if I had another one that was number five, that one would be evaluated before two forty three. All right. So we're going to say crypto ISA camp policy two four three. And again, what are our choices? Um, so for my authentication, I'm going to say it's a pre shared key. Uh, for my encryption, it's going to be AES-256. Uh, the group is going to be Diffie-Hellman Group 24. And the hash is going to be SHA-512. Uh, my lifetime, let's do the same thing, 43200. And that should be it for our settings there. Do show run section ISACAMP. All right, so that looks good. But what have we not done yet? You'll notice... We're not seeing anything over here yet, no activity, because again, we need to define, now that we've said it's gonna be, uh, the authentication's gonna be pre-share, I need to tell the router, okay, hey, this is who you're going to try to set this up with, right? So we exit out, and we go back to Crypto Isacamp again, right? And we're going to go ahead and say, uh, Crypto Isacamp, oops, sorry. Or not pre-share, peer, whoops. Crypto Isocamp peer address and the IP address. And I apologize, I'm supposed to have my key in there. Crypto Isocamp key. And we're going to use uh, Juniper. And then the address. Sorry about that. I wanted to get the key in there first. All right, so we've got the key. And then we're going to say Juniper. Now, here is where I define the address, the publicly reachable, or, or, or the reachable address. And in this case, it's the publicly reachable address of the Santa Rosa router R3. So I'm going to say 209.165.13.3 and 255, 255.240. And so now I put that information in there. And let's take a look at what we've got here. Begin ISACAM. All right, so we have our crypto ISACAM policy in here. We've got the encryption the hashing algorithm, authentication pre-share, Diffie-Hellman group, lifetime, and then I call out, and let me do the same thing over here, show run section, or show run begin, ISACAMP. Pull that down just a little bit. All right, so now we've got these things set up between the two routers, right? We've got all of our phase one settings are set up between the two routers, and we haven't seen any activity yet, but that's okay, because what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and complete our configuration um, all the way through here uh, on the Ike V1 side, right? Okay, so what comes next? We've that, so that's it for phase one. On the Ike V1 side, those are your phase one settings, right? Your policy, and then you set up your crypto isocamp key, you define your peer. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to define the IPsec transform set. Now, remember, these are going to be the phase two settings, or the quick mode, right? What, what, or what uh, IPsec for Ike V1 refers to as quick mode. 
And so prior to this, we did all the main mode settings, which is the phase one. Now we're going to do the quick mode settings, which are the phase two settings. And um, again, it's referred to as quick mode. So I'm going to set my transform setup. So it's uh, crypto IPsec. And we're going to say transform set. Now, and this is just you give it a name. So I'll say Travis uh, underscore transform set. Now, this is for the data, right? This is going to be how the data is handled. You can see that we talked, remember we talked about the authentication header, right? That's one of the protocols that you can use under IPsec. And then you've got the encapsulating security payload. So if I didn't need to have confidentiality, if my use case is, hey, I just need to make sure that the data is not being changed in, in, while it's en route from one router to the other, well, then you could use the authentication header. However, when you're going across the internet uh, with information of any significance at all, you're probably going to want confidentiality. You're going to want to encrypt that data. And so I'm going to say encapsulating security payload and for our integrity, we're going to use the SHA-512 uh, hashing message authentication code. And then I'm going to use ESP AES, ESP AES, and we'll use 256, right? Now, again, I could have thrown authentication header in there as well, but there's no need because ESP encapsulating security payload is going to do the authentication slash integrity for me of the messages that are going back and forth to make sure that they're not getting manipulated. So the next important part of the conversation comes down to the mode. You can see it kind of put us into a sub mode here. Well, this becomes important because now we're going to talk about uh, the tunnel mode versus uh, the transport mode and what the differences are there. And so I'm going to give you a, um, this is kind of a a generalization, but it's definitely one that I've seen followed is in terms of uh, best practices, is that when we're talking about tunnel mode, which is the default, so if I were to say mode question mark, it's either transport or tunnel. So tunnel is my default. If I were to say transport mode, when I'm talking about transport mode, that's going to encrypt, right, and it's going to encrypt things all the way up to um, it will put an uh, encapsulating security payload uh, header, but it's only going to encrypt layer four and up, or through layer, you know, layer four to layer seven inclusive, right? So the TCP, the the transport layer, uh, the session layer, the presentation layer, the uh, the application layer, and your data, right? That's going to be encrypted, okay? And then what gets authenticated is that same information. And actually, let me go ahead and kind of draw this out. So when we're talking about transport mode, right, what gets encrypted? Your layer four, right, your layer four, layer five, layer six, layer seven, right, so your data, okay? So that is going to get encrypted in transport mode. And typically, transport mode, again, this is going to be a generalization, typically transport mode is when you're going from a host an in station, right? Like a PC, a laptop, something like that. Whoops, PC, you know, then you maybe connect into a router, you go out over the internet to another router to another PC, okay? And so typically, this is the use case for transport mode. All right, and again, the key is, is what is encrypted? The only thing that's encrypted it's going to encrypt layer four through layer seven, right? So it's going to get your transport layer and your um, your data, right? Four, or five, six, and seven. Okay. Now, when we talk about tunnel mode with the encapsulating security payload, tunnel mode is a little different. And let me clear that off there. So in tunnel mode, let me look at the packet here, right? So for tunnel mode we're going to actually encrypt from layer three, the transport layer four, and then I'll, I'm just going to put data here. And we know that data is five through layers five through seven. So this is all encrypted when we talk about tunnel mode, right? So this is tunnel mode and all the way up to the IP header 
the original IP header gets encrypted. And then what you have here is you've got an encapsulating security payload header that gets added on, and then you've got a new IP, whoops, new IP header. So your new layer three information is outside of the encryption arena. And think about it, it has to be, right? Because if I encrypt my layer three, which is in 99% of the case is gonna be IP, whether it's V4 or V6, right? If I encrypt it here, right? I have to be able to put on here, where is this going, okay? And if you think about it, it makes sense because we defined where the traffic is gonna be uh, going to, right? Source and destination. And so that information is going to get pulled into here. We're going to get a new uh, layer three IP header, right? Okay. So that's the difference between transport mode and tunnel mode. Again, transport mode is going to encrypt all the way up, including up to and including your transport layer, layer four. And again, let me write down here. This is tunnel mode. And so that's transport layer is going to go all the way up through layer four. Okay, tunnel mode is going to encapsulate all the way up to, or I'm sorry, encrypt all the way up to layer three. So transport encrypts all the way up to layer four, tunnel all the way up to layer three, and then it throws a new header on there. So that's the major difference between the two. And again, the use case is the other one. So typically this is for, you know, I'll just say PC to PC. Uh, connectivity. The tunnel mode is definitely uh, the most popular use case is going to be for um, routers out on the internet or you know encrypted VPNs across the internet is your typical use case. Okay and again those are you know you don't have to use tunnel mode just because your two routers are going to be uh, publicly facing on the internet but again uh, those are the typical use cases, right? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to stick. We're going to say mode and I'll say tunnel, right? So now I've defined the transform set because, again, this is going to be how the data, not the keying material, right? Not the phase one part. This is for phase two. Uh, that's how it's going to be encrypted. I'm going to say crypto. Whoops. And you'll notice we're also using... Uh, the IPsec now is the keyword instead of isocamp where before we were saying isocamp to deal with the phase one stuff um, with Ike v1 now we're saying crypto IPsec to deal with uh, the remaining information so I'm gonna say crypto IPsec and I'm gonna create a profile here Let's make sure I'm not missing something oh sorry let me get out there so crypto IPsec profile Okay, now I'm going to create a profile name because this profile, this is the profile that we're going to apply to our tunnel. So I say crypto IPsec profile, I'm just going to say Travis IPsec profile, like that. So what are the things I can set here, right? So I can throw a description in here if I wanted to, um, and I, there's some set um, values that I need to set. So the first one that I need to set is the security association whoops security association lifetime right now this is again I can set this in days the number of kilobytes received um, the number of seconds right so let's go ahead and we'll say 43200 and this is not dealing this is not uh, integrating or talking about uh, working with the phase one remember earlier we set those phase one settings up here with the lifetime this is for phase one Right, this is for the keen material that we're uh, trying to protect. This security association lifetime is for the tunnel across which the data is going to go. So we'll go ahead and we'll set that lifetime to 12 hours. And I need to put seconds. Okay. All right. So we're going to set that to 12 hours, and now I'm going to set the transform set. So I'm creating this profile, right? The profile is going to be applied to the static virtual tunnel interface. But what transform set is it going to use? So this basically refers back to the transform set that we just created, which is the name is there we go. Travis IPsec profile. 
Make sure I've got that right. No, I'm sorry. Travis transform set. All right, didn't go back far enough, so copy and paste. So there we go. So the transform set is simply Travis underscore TFS for transform set. All right, so that, at this point, those are my phase two. So I'm done with phase one and phase two. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So I'm gonna exit out here. I'm actually gonna type in, let's save our config for now. And let me go ahead and do a show run. And we're gonna begin with Isacamp. All right, so we've got pretty much everything we're looking for uh, in one window there. So here's my phase one configuration information, right? And that's my keen. How am I gonna protect my keen? Here is all my phase two information, okay? And so that's the difference between when you're using the ISACAMP keyword and you're using the IPSec keyword is within the, within the scope of IKEV1, when I say ISACAMP, I'm referring to phase one. When I say IPSec, I'm referring to phase two. All right, so then we will quickly go ahead and knock out the peer configuration over here on router three. So again, it's gonna be crypto IPSec and we're gonna do the transform set and what did I do? We'll just call it the same thing. We'll say Travis underscore transform set. AES, or actually what are we looking at here? Yeah, ESP AES 256 and then ESP SHA 512. And that's okay because of IPsec transform. Okay, that's fine. And then we're gonna go ahead and say mode tunnel, right? Now I'm gonna exit out of here. The final thing I'm gonna do is crypto IPsec profile. Oops, profile, we're gonna say Travis underscore, and you'll see why I'm putting IPsec in here because I wanna differentiate it on the other side. Oh, when we talk about Ike V2, because you have, there's two profiles and you'll see what we're talking about there. So I'm gonna go ahead and say crypto IPsec profile and I'll put the profile name in here and then we're gonna set the security association lifetime and I need seconds, so 43200. And then I'm also gonna set the transform set, which is simply Travis underscore TF, whoops, TFS. All right, so now both sides do show run begin isocamp. Both sides of these connections have their phase one and their phase two settings um, up and ready to go. Now, what we need to do next is to create a tunnel, because you'll notice that there's nothing happening, right? We don't have anything going on because these are not crypto maps that I'm applying to the physical interfaces, right? So I could, if I was doing crypto maps, I would apply one to serial 000 uh, on this side over here, and then the same thing serial 000 over here, but that's not what we're doing because I'm gonna create a tunnel interface between the two. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna say interface TU0, and that's gonna create uh, a GRE interface for me. And so and this is gonna change. So if I were to say do show interface TU0, let's take a look at the information that we get here. So what is my tunnel protocol and transport? Well, right now it's GRE. You'll also notice that the MTU dropped to 1476. And the reason that it dropped to 1476 is because GRE encapsulation adds overhead, right? So in order to get the GRE header information onto uh, the packet, right, it's gonna cost us 24 bytes uh, because GRE is gonna put a GRE header on there with information that it needs. But again, this is gonna change here shortly. So what do I want my tunnel interface to be? Well, let's go ahead and say IP address. We'll just use 10.10.10. On this side, it's three. We're just gonna make it a slash 24. So my tunnel destination, right? What's my tunnel destination? Well, my tunnel destination has to be a reachable address. And in this use case here, where we're going out over the internet, it's gonna be that public facing IP. So 
Destination is going to be 209.165.47. And that's router 4. It should be 4. Let me double check. Yep. All right, so it's 4. So that's my tunnel destination. What about my tunnel source? So I can actually put an interface in here. So I could say serial 000. Or I could simply dump in my IP address. So I'll choose to go serial 000 and put that in there. And you can see that it says the tunnel state has changed to up, right? Now there's a couple more things that we need here. So if I say do show run interface tunnel zero, you can see that right now we've got your basic, you know, and again, right now this is a GRE tunnel, but we're gonna change that. Because again, we're doing a static virtual tunnel interface that's going to remove the need for GRE encapsulation. All right. So I've got my tunnel source, my tunnel destination, my IP address. So now, remember that uh, the profile that we created, right? I'm going to go ahead and say tunnel protection IPsec profile. And what was the name of the IPsec profile I created? It was Travis IPsec profile. And actually, let me make sure I get this right. What did I put in there for my profile name? Oh, I put prof instead of spelling it out. Okay. All right, so let me just copy that, and we'll come back down. And actually, we don't even need to copy that. We'll just drop that in. So tunnel protection. All right, so now we've got our ISACAMP Phase 1 debug on. Okay, because remember, we're not going to move to Phase 2 until we complete Phase 1. So, and now it's sending. You can see it's going to be sending packets across, right? Uh, for the main mode, right? So the main mode, no state, right? That's what this MMNO means. Because remember, we had main mode and then we could choose in phase one, we had our choice. We could do main mode or we could do aggressive mode. So this is saying main mode, no state, it's, it keeps retransmitting, right? Because again, we haven't set up the other side. However, this is great output here because it's gonna give us visibility into what's taking place. So take a look. Uh, and actually, let me kill this real quick here. So we'll say, do you all. And so this is why I wanted to make sure I had the ISACAMP debug on. So as soon as I kicked up the profile, you can see we get this ISACAMP is on, right? Security Association request profile is null. And we're going to create a peer structure for router 4. Because again, I'm trying to contact router 4. The new peer gets created, uh, port 500, right? Um, and let's see, what else do we have in here? So now this means successfully uh, inserted the security association. Will it put it into uh, the security association database, right? And here you go. Cannot start aggressive mode, because we didn't call out aggressive mode, trying main, main mode. So found a pre-shared key matching. Okay, and this is for NAT traversal here, but we're not doing any kind of NAT. Um, and then we've got input message from so a request main mode. So this is, again, this is the messages from IPsec here. So it says Ike Security Association requesting main mode, right? Because that's, we're trying main mode here, not aggressive mode. And then Ike is ready, beginning main mode exchange. So I'm sending packets, right? You can see. That, that router three here over in Santa Rosa, California is actively transmitting packets over to router four, trying to get that uh, security association, the main mode set up. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and turn the debug back on. And actually there's one last thing I wanted to do. If I say show run int tu zero, sorry, show int tu zero. If I say show int tu0, let's take a look now. You can see we've got the tunnel source, right? So there's our source information, our destination information for the tunnel. And there's a key thing we want to look at here. You can see it still says 1,476 bytes because the tunnel protocol transport is GRE over IP. Well, with the static virtual tunnel interface, I'm going to go into tunnel zero here. So do show run int tu0. With a static virtual tunnel interface, right, we're going to change the mode of the tunnel because we're not using GRE. 
So I'm going to say tunnel mode IPsec. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm going to make sure I get into TU0. Let me make sure I'm doing the right thing here. Yeah, tunnel mode IPv4 IPsec. No, it is IPsec. Yeah, it's something I'm not sure I typed wrong before there. So yeah, so tunnel mode is going to be IPsec IPv4. And let's watch what happens to the output of the show int tunnel zero now. So you can see, as soon as I did that, the interface goes down, right? So I'm going to say do show uh, int tunnel zero. And what do you notice that's changed? Exactly. What is the protocol now? Is it GRE? It's not. It's IPsec. And you can also see, and this is proof that GRE is no longer in the equation here because the tunnel transport maximum transmission unit, the MTU, is 1,500 bytes. If GRE was involved like we saw before, this value would have been 24 bytes lower than it is right now, which was 1,476. Okay. Now we can also see tunnel protection via IPsec, and there's the profile that's protecting this tunnel, right? Okay, so let's take one look at the do show, show run int tu0. What does that tunnel interface look like right now? There it is. So that's sort of the full config for my tunnel interface, okay, on router 3 on Santa Rosa. Now remember, we're uh, debugging this right now. Let me forget that. Let's get the debug kick backed off here. Debug crypto, ISA camp. So we want to keep the debug going. And what we should see when we get ready to uh, complete our configuration over here on router 4, um, and there we go. You, so you can see, what does it still do? It's retransmitting, right? So router 3 is actively trying to pursue uh, the security association setup with router 4. However, we don't have anything set up here yet on router 4, so let's go ahead and knock that out right now and watch it as it will transition from main mode in phase 1 into quick mode, which is why you'll, you're going to see that QM, right? And actually, we uh, oh, it ran by on me there. Where is it at here? It was it, Exactly what I was looking for was just on the screen. Uh, the quick, uh, not the quick mode, sorry. Or, I mean, yeah, the quick mode, the QM. Where did it go? Yeah, so you can see the main mode has no state, right? Because uh, we're unable to negotiate, and there was the quick mode. I, it was on the screen just two seconds ago. I apologize. And we'll probably, I'm sure we're going to see it again here as it transitions into quick mode. Uh, but what I was hoping to grab was where it shows that the quick mode is failing. Uh, there it is, set, set QM idle. Right. All right. Well, I'm gonna. I'll, we'll come back. We're gonna see that again. So anyway, the quick mode is an idle, right? Because it can't do anything. Okay. So, router three is actively trying to set things up. Let's come over to router four. And remember, on router four, we've got all of the phase one settings done. We've got all of our phase two settings done. Now let's go ahead and knock out that tunnel interface. So int tunnel zero IP address is going to be ten dot ten dot ten dot Four. I'm just going to say slash 24. Okay. And then we're going to say tunnel, whoops, uh, tunnel source is going to be serial 000. Tunnel destination is going to be 209.165.13.3. Do show run in, whoops, do show run interface TU0. So that's all we have right now, right? We've got our basic tunnel settings in here. So now let's go ahead and apply I'm going to get the profile name here. Yeah, because over here I put IPsec prof instead of profile. So let's go ahead now and on our tunnel interface, let's say tunnel protection, IPsec profile. And what is that IPsec profile called over here? Travis IPsec prof. We'll say copy and paste. And let's watch what happens. Let's see if we see some messages here. All right, we've definitely got some more activity going on over here.
and I'm gonna go ahead and do a do you all see if I can or you all see if I can get us out of here uh, you all there we go okay all, all debugging is off so let me roll back up here and the ISA camp can be definitely a little chatty uh, so let's take a look right whoops so processing hash payload so here we go so as you can see what's taking place now is as soon as I put the IPsec profile on there it is now trying to go ahead and negotiate <coughs> excuse me the settings so we've got the same duration right the authenticator is HMAC uh, SHA-512 my key length is 256 the attributes are acceptable um, let's see what else we've got up here that I may have scrolled past. The new state Ike quick mode, right? So you can see we've made it past phase one. We're now moving to phase two, which is the Ike quick mode. And here is the Ike quick mode exchange taking place. And then Ike quick mode phase two is complete. Okay. And then you can see it says retransmitting. Let me clear the screen out here. Then it says it's retransmitting phase one. So let's come all the way back down to the end. And we're going to have an error. Right? You can see that it's Ike, uh, information notify Ike phase one complete. Okay? So the phase one completed. And then we were working our way through phase two. Because what's the one thing we left off over here on the tunnel? So let's see, can I ping the other side? So do ping 10.10.10.3. So you'll notice that I can't ping the other end of the tunnel. So back here on router three, can I ping 10.10.10.4? I can't ping the other side of the tunnel. So if I were to say show run interface tunnel zero, and then we'll bring this guy up here and we'll say do show run interface tunnel zero. What's the difference? So the difference is the tunnel mode. Because remember, it's different uh, a, a different protocol, right? One side's using GRE. So if I say do show int TU zero, this side is using, uh, where did it go? completely missing it here oh there we go sorry my mouse is right on top of it so tunnel protocol so you can see this side is using GRE right the other side is using IPsec so let's go ahead and complete the configuration here and say tunnel mode IPsec and IPv4 all right Let's see what else happens over here. So the state changed up, and so let me see if I can squeak the debug in here real quick, if it's too late. So we've got our debug on on the Santa Rosa side. In fact, let me do this. Let me pull this off, and then let me put it back on. And so you can see we're receiving errors, right? Because one side's GRE, and the other side is IPsec in terms of the protocol. So now I add in the tunnel mode IPsec. So I say do show uh, run interface TU0. And so now we do have the tunnel mode IPsec on there. So let's see if I can say do ping 3. .10 all right, so take a look at that. We've got connectivity now between both sides of the tunnel. So let me see if I can squeak in a you all. There we go. Okay. All right. And so then again, here, really nice. Ike quick mode phase two complete. Okay. So the old state was Ike quick mode uh, for, and I'm not sure, I'm actually not sure what that RQM2 stands for. It's got to be responder maybe instead of the initiator but the key thing here is that our Ike phase our Ike quick mode phase two is complete right and so what's the message that follows it tunnel interface is up so I should have connectivity now from three as well over to four 
Now, remember, we said, what's the use case here? When would I want to do something like this? Well, I want to encrypt everything that goes across the tunnel. Now, another benefit of the static virtual tunnel interface is I'm not doing GRE, but that's okay. The static virtual tunnel interface is different from a crypto map. And here's where. So the crypto map doesn't have or doesn't install any kind of a virtual interface into the routing table, right? Because remember, the crypto map, you just create the map and then you slap it or apply it onto uh, the physical interface or the virtual interface that you're looking to put it on. Whereas with the static virtual tunnel interface, a, an interface gets put into the routing table for me. So if I say show IP route, right, where is my tunnel interface? It's right here. There's my directly connected tunnel interface. So with the static virtual tunnel interface, I can actually run a routing protocol across this. So let's say, and let me go ahead and say show IP, whoops, show IP interface brief. And I've got the tunnel, I've got this loop back here, and I think I wanted to use, yeah, so the loop back zeros I have on these routers, right? These are gonna be used to simulate a local area network. So really, what am I talking about, right? I'm using a loop back address, but all the loop back address is, is just simulating here is, okay, let's say on the router that this is FA00, and I have a connection out here to a switch, layer two switch, right? and I've got all my PCs plugged in. So here are my PCs out here. Put a PC over here, and we're gonna say that this PC is 192.168.47.4, and that's that PC's address. And the default gateway here would be, if in fact this is what we were doing, or I'm actually on the wrong side. So that's for router four, so let me actually wipe that out and let me go ahead and real quickly here, pull that same information up here, say show IP interface brief. It's the same concept. I want to make sure I keep it on the right, on the correct uh, side of the map for you. So you can see I've got this loopback zero address here. It's the same thing. So what am I, what am I simulating with this loopback address? I'm simply simulating that if this was FA00, whoops, FA, pull that off of there. Getting a little sloppy there. I come out to my switch over here in my somewhere in my company and I've got my PCs hanging off here, right? The loopback interface that I've got is going to simulate that we've got a PC over here and this PC is 192.168.13.3, right? And if this was the default gateway, it would be 192.168.13.1. Okay? Because again, that's all the loopback interface is going to simulate for me. I'm just trying to make it look or make the router think that it's got this reachable address, right? And, and really, this is all I'm simulating here. And again, this is just a layer two switch. All right. So there's a couple ways. I'm not going to clear that. I'm going to leave that up. There's a couple ways that I could get this to work. So right now on router four, if I try to ping over there to 192.168.13.3, what happens? I get the U, right? Unreachable. I can't reach it. So if I were to say show IP route right now, do I have a route over to 192.168.13? I don't. You can see I've got 192.168.47. I don't have any way to get over there. So there's a very easy way I could handle this, and we'll do this one first. I could throw a static route in here, right? So I'll say IP route to get to 192.168.13.0. Uh, that I am going to go out of, yeah, so the tunnel interface, right? So what about now? Is it going to work? What do you think? 168.13.3. It works, right? So I get out, and now I can ping over there. However, from router 3, if I try to ping across, let's see what happens. 68.47.4, was that right? You can see it's still unreachable because router 3 has no route to get there. Show IP route. I have no route to a 192.168.47. Uh, so let me do the same thing. Let me add a route in here. So IP route to 192.168.47.0. Uh, 
I'm going to go out my tunnel interface because again, I want that traffic between my LAN, my local area network hosts, my 192.168s, to be encrypted, and I want it to be encrypted across the internet. So I've added this route in here. So if somebody's sitting at a PC over on the LAN segment behind R4 says, okay, let me ping 192.168.13.3. There we go. And so what have we just done here? In effect, and let's say the same thing, in effect, right? If I've got FA00 here and it goes off and I've got my layer two switch over here, and I've got a PC over here, and this PC is 192.168.47.4. What I'm doing is, and let me change my color here to green, is through the internet, I now have a fully encrypted IPsec, and that was not supposed to be a capital C there, IPsec tunnel that will encrypt everything that comes across the tunnel interface. And so right now I've got two static routes that basically tell everybody over here on the 192.168.47 when your traffic hits the router it goes across the tunnel and same thing over here hits the router come across the tunnel. And so the individual at this PC let's say that this PC here is a um, is a, a file share server, right? File share. This PC can now access the file share information on that server over an IPsec encrypted tunnel, right? And again, this is just one use case. And the great thing about the static virtual tunnel interface is that GRE is not involved, so we don't have an additional 24 bytes that we have to account for as part of the MTU. And the, and the setup is very, very straightforward and very simple. Now, the next massive benefit is what if you are, you know, hey, we love OSPF, right? So I want my tunnel to run OSPF because I'm going to be putting in all kinds of networks. Can I run a dynamic routing protocol um, across the static virtual tunnel interface? And I think I'm, unfortunately, let me drag this over here. Okay. So I'll do this. I'll drag this over to try to leave that up as a point of reference so that everything makes a little more sense. So let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to yank out my static routes. So say control A, no. And then I'm going to say router OSPF uh, 1. And let's log adjacency changes. Let me get a router ID in here, 4.4.4.4. And that is pretty much it. So we'll go to int tunnel zero, and I'm gonna say IP OSPF one area zero, right? Now, the key thing is I've put it on the tunnel interface, right? Let me also go ahead and we wanna advertise, because remember, we're talking about advertising the networks, right? So the static route I had set up was for the 192.168.47.1. So what I'll have to do here is go into uh, interface loopback zero and say IP OSPF one area zero. And that is going to originate uh, the loopback address that's simulating that PC over there. And let's do the same thing over here. Let's pull back that static route. As soon as I pull the static route back, can I ping? Whoops, I'm sorry. I can still ping, did I pull that static? I did, let me see, do show IP route. So we've got here. So I've got no route to show run section route. And I have a static that was for the connectivity. Yeah, oh, that's for the connectivity across. And let's go ahead now and turn on OSPF. So we're going to say router OSPF1. We're going to log adjacency changes. We're going to put a router ID on here of 3.3.3.3. .3 .3 .3. And we're going to go into interface tunnel zero. I'm going to say IP OSPF one area zero. And let's see if we have an adjacency established. And take a look at that. Right, went from loading to full. Now, prior to being able to do the static virtual tunnel interface, what did you have to do? Remember, you couldn't do the dynamic routing protocols across an IPsec 
over GRE. You had to have GRE encapsulate the dynamic routing protocol updates, all the multicast information, right? Then you could jam it into IPsec and that would work. You had to have GRE though. So here there's no GRE, but again, the static virtual tunnel interface, it's creating that interface in the routing table for us, which is different than the crypto map. So I went from loading to full. Uh, let's go into interface loopback zero, and I'm gonna say IP OSPF one, area zero. And so let's do a do show IP route. And what do we have here? Take a look at that. What have I just learned via OSPF across the tunnel interface? I, had, I now have a route to get over to the 192.168.47.4, and it's not a static route. It was learned via OSPF, right? Coming from my neighbor. So if I were to say do show IP OSPF neighbor, there you go, right? Now, the key thing to remember here is it's a tunnel. So it's a point-to-point -point interface. Uh, do show IP OSPF interfaces, and there it is. So that's what I'm looking for. Here we go. So the tunnel zero interface. So by default, what kind of an interface is the tunnel interface? It's point to point. So there's no DR BDR election. And it, very important here, take a look at that. The cost is pretty heavy, right? So it's got a cost of a thousand in OSPF. Uh, so definitely be aware of that in terms of if maybe you had another route somewhere with a lower OSPF cost to get to that segment, you're, it's not gonna go across the tunnel but now it is going across uh, the tunnel interface. So we've got our tunnel interfaces up. Now, how do we know that the traffic is being encrypted? So if I were to say over here on router four, let's do a ping to 10.10, I'm sorry, not the tunnel interface. I'm gonna ping uh, the what is quote unquote, this file share, let's say. So 192.168.13.3, and I'm gonna throw a big number at it here. So take a look at that, right? This is router four, okay? And so let's say that I'm, in fact, I'll even source it from, uh, I need to make sure I source this, and we'll say source uh, from loopback zero. So there we go. So I'm sourcing it from the 47.4, which again, it's just pretending, simulating the fact that we've got this PC out here, right? I've got full blown connectivity, everything looks great, but how do I actually know that this is being encrypted? Well, let's go ahead and type in show crypto isocamp SA, right? So here is my information as to do I even have a security association with anybody? And if I do, what state am I in? Quick mode idle. This is exactly the state that you wanna be in because this means that quick mode is idle. It's, we, we're done. We've established the adjacency, the security association. There's the destination. Here's the source of who I have the security association with. Another thing to remember, the security associations are bi-directional. You're gonna have one for both directions, inbound and outbound. I think there's a detail, there we go. So if I take a look at the detail, uh, you can see here, what else does it show me as part of the information? My status is active. It gives me the encryption information, the hash I'm using, the fact that it's pre-shared key. So what do you think? When I type in show crypto isocamp SA, is it giving me phase one or phase two information? If you thought phase one, you're absolutely right. Because remember, when we use that ISACAMP keyword, when we did our config, what was that all about? That was all about phase one. And so here is our phase one information. Now, if I were to say show crypto IPsec SA, what phase do you think it, because you'll notice the ISACAMP, does it show me any information about encrypted packets, about the data plane, what's going on across the data plane? Nothing. If I do a show crypto IPsec SA, we're gonna end up with some more information here, much more information and especially valuable information with respect to whether or not traffic that is going across that tunnel interface, right? So here we go, interface is tunnel zero, okay? Um, it shows that we've got 12,128 packets have been 
uh, encapsulated or encrypted, right? And we've decrypted or decapsulated uh, 12,136. So clearly, this information uh, that's going across the tunnel is being encrypted. So if I were to say and run that command again, whoops, hold on one second here. So if I were to quit and then run the command again, does that 12,000 number go up? Take a look at that. Because remember, we've got these pings are going crazy over here, and it's adding up, right? And you can see, so this is how you validate that the traffic is actually being encrypted going across my tunnel interface. And let me see if I can pull these out here. So again, this shows you that those packets are being encrypted and decrypted going across the tunnel. And that's one of the nice things about the SVTI is that everything that we route across this tunnel, and I'm using OSPF and it works great, right? I could use EIGRP and it would work just as good. Everything that comes across my tunnel zero interface is going to be encrypted. All right, so this wraps up the Ike V1 portion, right? We've got now we've got that totally stood up. And so this is how you would create a static virtual tunnel interface with Ike using Ike V1. And again, what's our use case here? Hey, I've got a small office over here in Crofton, Maryland. I've got a small office here in Santa Rosa, California. I've got two publicly routable IPs that I, you know, from my service provider. Maybe I had enough money to get statics, right? I've applied those static IPs on these interfaces, and I've now created an IPsec tunnel, fully encrypted, fully protected, so that people here in Crofton, and specifically this guy right here, gal on this PC, can access the file share server over here in Santa Rosa, California. And again, it's just not these two, right? If you know, I have a slash 24 here, so it could be that entire subnet. So any PC over here can uh, communicate with any of the PCs over here. I can get information, exchange information. And again, all of that information is encrypted coming across my tunnel. We looked at uh, the configs. And so let me pull the configs up one last time here so that you can see the final configurations. And let me actually, I'm going to go ahead and clear this off. Clear that off now. And we're going to say... Uh, show run and the first thing that we'll look at is well, we'll say yeah section isocamp so there's my phase one information IPsec there's my phase two information and then let's take a look at show run interface tunnel zero and that's what the tunnel looks like right remember that destination has got to be in our scenario here has to be publicly accessible, right? I got to be able, have to have reachability uh, to that interface. And then again, I've completely secured the communications between Santa Rosa and Crofton. So let me drop this guy down here. And I'm actually going to go ahead, I'll leave those guys up for a second. So now let's wrap up our configuration over here across this MPLS Layer 3 VPN tunnel. So where did we leave off? Let's say show run include, or let's say show run section Ike V2. So that's where we're at so far on that guy. Let's take a look over here on router four, show run section Ike V2. All right, so not much going on on router four, but we've got router two configured. So let's go ahead and configure router four. And one of the nice things is to kind of speed things up a bit here is that I can certainly borrow information. So we're going to drop in our, our uh, proposal. The proposal is then tied to the policy. And whoops, and there's one thing I need to do. See what I need to change right there, right? Um, let's go crypto policy. Where's the policy? Yeah, there we go. And I'm going to say no match address local uh, 10.20.50.2 because that is not this guy's local address. So we're going to say match address local 10.40.50.4. All right, and then we can exit out. And for the key ring, I can copy. Yeah, well, here's what I'll do. I'll just type it in here. Crypto Ike v2 because remember, we're on router 4 now. 
So I'm doing my key ring. So this is going to be Travis underscore key ring. And we're going to say the peer is r2 dot unix underground dot oops dot com. And again, that's just a descriptor. So I'll put my description in here. So key ring for r. I put r4 up there. I'll just go put r2 here. And then we'll put the address in here. So what's the address going to be? It's going to be 10.20.50.2 of my peer. And pre-shared key is Juniper. All right, so that part's taken care of. So let me make sure I've got this straight. I've got the proposal, the profile. All right, so now we finished with our phase one uh, setup. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and continue on with the rest of the configuration. And again, this is Ike v2. So I'm going to say crypto Ike v2, Ike v2 profile. So now I'm creating a, a profile here. And this is going to be um, my Ike v2 profile, which the transform set is going to uh, end up getting tied to. And so, or I'm sorry, the, the, the profile here is going to get tied to the transform set. So Ike v2 profile, and um, let's just call it uh, Travis underscore profile. All right, so good. Again, a nice reminder. I need a local and remote authentication method, method and uh, match identity or certificate. So here we go. So we'll say match identity. So how, am I, how do I want to identify my routers? Um, so the remote one, I can do it from fully qualified domain name, um, email. So we'll use address, right? Because that's going to be the easiest thing to do here. So router two says 10.40.50.4, which is router four. And the mask is a slash 32. All right, so that's the identity of the remote peer. My local authentication is going to be pre-share. My remote authentication is going to be pre-share. So again, I'm kind of rounding out the phase one. And I think I'm, if I said phase two prior to that, I apologize. So this is kind of fi finishing out the phase one uh, setup here. OK. And really with Ike v2, again, it's synonymous with phase one from Ike v1. They don't refer to it as uh, phase one, phase two, you know, the, or I should say the modes are gone, right? There is no main mode, um, really not referred to, no aggressive mode. So we've got our pre-shared key in there, and now we have to talk about our key ring, uh, which is going to be the local, and what do we call that? I think I call it Travis underscore key ring. And then the identity, so specify the local Ike identity to use for negotiation. Well, we're not using uh, the identity for negotiation. So we've already got that in there, match identities. Yeah, let me take a look here real quick. So we'll say do show run section Ike v2. All right, so here's my profile, crypto Ike v2 profile, Travis profile. So match identity from the remote peer. So I identify my remote peer. I say how we're going to do the authentication. It's going to be pre-share. And I put the key ring in here and Travis key ring. Yep, that's correct. I'm just double checking my settings here. And I'm going to say the identity of this guy is r2.unixunderground.com. Oops. Actually, yeah, I don't believe I need the identity. Yeah, I don't think I need that identity. So we're good at this point. Okay, so again, so do show run section Ike v2. And this is also the nice thing, right? So I get everything associated with Ike v2 in here, right? And we're ready to go. So now, the equivalent of phase one is that's the equivalent of phase one configuration right there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the equivalent of the phase two component. And that's going to be setting up the transform set. So here it looks very familiar, right? Crypto IPsec transform set. And I'm going to call it Travis, same thing, transform set. We're going to do um, ESP AES 256. I think that's, yeah, 256. And then we'll stick with the um, 
integrity of ESP Shaw. Where's that? 512. There we go. Shaw 512 HMAC. Again, the mode is going to be tunnel by default, so we don't actually have to enter that in, but I'll go ahead and put mode tunnel default. And and so again, very similar to when we did the Ike phase one. We did the transform set, and now I'm going to come right back and I'm going to do the profile. Because again, I'm creating the profile because we're doing the static virtual tunnel interface. If we were doing sort of the legacy way to do it with the crypto map, I wouldn't be creating the profile. I'd, I'd be going to creating the crypto map. So I'm going to create the IPsec profile, and I'm just going to call this Travis underscore IPsec profile, not to confuse it with the um, Ike v2 profile. This is going to be the IPsec profile. So same thing, right? I'm going to set the transform set, uh, which we just set up as Travis underscore transform set. And I'm also going to set the Ike v2 profile. Now, and that's why I used, for the profile name here, that's why I said Travis IPsec profile, not to be confused with Travis underscore, and I think I just called it profile. I should probably check that before I move on. Yeah, I just called it Travis underscore profile, right? All right, so that is it for phase two, right? So the phase one work is done, now the phase two work is done. So if I say do show run section IPsec, there is my transform set config, and here is my profile, just like we did over here, right? For, fa uh, for Ike v1, there's my transform set, there's my profile, and I want to make sure I'm not grabbing too much, because yeah, this is down on the uh, on the tunnel interface. And so there you go, right? Okay, so we've got these things set up now. I'm going to go ahead and let me save this off here to make sure that we don't lose anything. All right, so now I'm going to type in debug um, Ike v2 or crypto, sorry, crypto Ike v2 and I'm going to debug everything. So we've got debugging on for everything uh, here for Ike v2. So let's come back down to where we just set the key ring up is where we left off on router 4. So let's exit out here, exit again, do show run section Ike v2. All right, so we've got the key ring. We're looking good. So we're going to do the profile next. So crypto Ike v2 profile and this is going to be Travis underscore and I'll put in here Ike v2 to make sure we keep it different than the IPsec profile so we've got the Ike v2 profile in here so I want to match the identities of by yeah by a, a match identity is it remote yeah remote address and the remote address is going to be 10.20.50.2 and that's for router 2 over there and it's a slash 32. And then we're going to put authentication local as pre share key. Authentication remote is pre share key. And then what key ring are we using, right? So key ring local is Travis underscore key ring. And that should do it for the profile setup. It does. All right. So now we're going to transition into excuse me, into the uh, the transform set. So crypto IPsec transform set is going to be Travis underscore transform set. And I'm going to do ESP AES 256. And we're going to do, oops, sorry, I wanted to do more than that. Um, I want to get out of there. So there we go, AES. And then we're going to do ESP dash SHA 512. OK, there we go. Now we're set. So we got the transform set set up mode is going to be tunnel, which is again your default. Let me exit out here and let's match up the profile IPsec uh, with the Ike settings. So uh, crypto IPsec profile is going to be Travis and I'll call it IPsec profile. And we're going to set the transform set to Travis underscore transform set. And we're also going to set 
uh, the Ike V2 profile that it's tied to. And remember, we called this Travis underscore Ike V2 underscore profile. All right, so do show run section IPsec. So there we go. We've got our transform set information like we did. Same thing that we had over here. All right, let me pull that back up. Same thing that we had over here. And then we've got our profile. And our profile basically associates the, tra associates the transform set that we want to have this profile use. And then it ties to the Ike V2 profile, which has all of our pre-share key information. And it refers to our key ring. Okay. All right. So same thing as last time. Now we've got end-to-end -end reachability here between Crofton and Santa Rosa across the MPLS L3 VPN core. So what are we going to do next? Well, what we want to do now is we want to create those tunnel interfaces. So I'm going to do it first over here. And this is going to look um, almost identical. In fact, I think it is identical. It's going to look almost identical to what we just did earlier. So I'll say int tunnel 0. And I'm going to say my IP address for the tunnel. Let's make it 10.10.10.2 because .10 uh, router 2. Make it a slash 24. So my tunnel source is going to be my loopback address. right? Remember, you can use loopback addresses because I'm advertising. We have reachability between these guys. And my destination, same thing, loopback address on router 4, 10.40.50.2. And now we're going to say tunnel. Uh, well, actually, we'll put the protection on first. So tunnel protection IPsec profile, and then the name of the IPsec profile. Well, it was Travis underscore IPsec, I believe. Hold on, let me double check this real quick. Control U, do show run, section IPsec. Crypto IPsec profile, there it is. So the Travis IPsec profile. So we're going to say tunnel protection IPsec profile is Travis underscore IPsec underscore profile. Now you can see Isacamp. It says Isacamp on. Because remember, we don't say Isacamp with Ike V2. In the config, We very rarely do we type in the, ice, the word Isacamp. In fact, I don't think it's anywhere uh, in that config. And what's it come back with? It says uh, getting pre-shared key from profile key ring, Travis underscore key ring, Ike V2 key not found, Ike V2 failed to initiate SA, right? So then let's also put on here the tunnel mode is going to be IPsec IP4, or IPv4, sorry about that. So again, if I say do show run, let's take a look at this whole config here. So here comes the crypto section now. So there's the proposal, the policy, the key ring with the pre-share, right? Pre-share key, uh, Juniper. I've got my profile, where I call out the remote, uh, the remote address. Um, we've got the transform set, and we've got the crypto profile, which then gets applied to this tunnel interface, right? So let's finish out over here. Same thing in tunnel zero. IP address 10.10.10.2, .10 uh, is going to be router 2. And then we're going to say tunnel source, loopback 0. Tunnel destination is going to be 10.20.50.2. Tunnel mode is going to be IPsec IPv4. And then let's get our protection on here. Uh, tunnel protection, IPsec, profile, and let me make sure I call it Travis. There it is, Travis IPsec profile. And Travis IPsec profile. And as soon as I put that in here, take a look at what happened. So we get some kickback out of our debug. And it looks like our security association may have failed. Right. Oh, whoops. So let me get out of there. All right. Looks like it may have failed. So with Ike v2, right, what are the commands that we're going to use to validate what's going on? You can see here, shows he's sending the packets, right? Still 
port 500 because again we're going across <clears throat> excuse me we're going across the uh, the tunnel interface and authentication exchange failed right so you can see we've it's deleting the security association so something's wrong on the authentication side possibly with the pre-shared key so over here let me go ahead and do a write mem so if I were to say and I've probably got a typo in here somewhere show crypto show crypto session detail right and you can see phase one ID none so there's not much information with the crypto session detail how about show crypto Ike v2 session do we have anything no there is no Ike v2 session and you could also do a detail on that so let's do some troubleshooting here real quick let's do a show run so something's not right with the authentication so let's double check here and let me kill the debugs here and do a show run and let's compare the configs so I'll put this guy up here to the top shrink this guy down I probably typoed something so the proposal, right, we're good there. The integrity is the same and the group is the same. The policy is match address local. That's right. Tied to the proposal, 10, 20, 50. That's right. So it's something with the authentication. The peer is r4, unixunderground.com. Description, key ring for r2, key ring for r4. Now, do I have this backwards? The address is 10.20.50.2, 10.40.50.4, pre shared key JUNIPER, Juniper Crypto, Ike V2 profile, Travis Ike V2 profile. Let's see here. Remote address 10.20.50.2, 10.20.50. Remote pre share, remote pre share, key ring local, Travis underscore key ring. That's right. The tunnel interface here. And that's got the right profile. The destination is correct. Just let me see. Show in TU0. And again, you can see here, as I'm looking for some other information, you see it's still IPsec, right? and the transport MTU is set. There's no GRE involved. And so it's got to be in my key ring. Key ring has the address. Show run section key ring. Description. Key ring for R2. And yeah, I'm just checking right now to see if I've got the key ring possibly backwards on this. But that is supposed to be the key of the peer, so that's absolutely right. Let me make sure. Yeah, if that was supposed to be... Pre shared key is Juniper, so that's not misspelled. Um, I've got my profile is correct. All right, something's got to be backwards here. And I just don't see it. You're probably screaming at the screen right now saying, hey, it's this. Um, where would that be? Okay, so we've got... Looking at, I'm just looking over all of the... the information there there's got to be in the pr 
profile is it wrong no that looks good the mode is correct Identity. Do I have in there for my identity is what I'm missing? Or if, oh no, I've got match identity remote address under the profile. I'm missing my local address. That I think. Oh, you know what? Hold on. I'm, I apologize. Um, let's go into Crypto Ike V2 profile and copy and paste that. And I think there's an. Do I? I don't have that in there. I don't have any local address. Okay, so for router two, I'm going to be 10.20.50.2. Two, and I don't think I had that in there. Do you show run section IP2. So now in the profile, IP2 profile, I've got the local address defined. And then over here, show run section IP2. And I think I left something out. Yeah, I'm matching the identities. Oh, you know what? It was, yeah. When I, ha I was looking at that before, I was looking at that thinking I didn't need to have that in there, and I absolutely need to have that in there to identify the actual client. I apologize. Yeah, so this identity local address needs to be in there. So over here underneath, because I think up here, what did I, do? I just called it profile. Down here, I called it Ike v2 profile. And I, whoops, I need to add in here, absolutely, identity local address is 10 dot, whoops, 40 dot, 50 dot, not 400, 10 dot, 50 dot, 4. Okay, so the local address is in here. And let's go ahead and say end and then debug crypto Ike v2. Let me clear crypto Ike v2 SA just all. All right, so let's see what happens. And it looks like we might be in the same boat that we were just in. Show run int tunnel zero. 10, 10, 10, 2 is my address, source leap back 0. Tunnel mode is right, destination and source are right, and the protection is right. So I've got something wrong with one of my, it's got to be with the keys. Let me clear it, let me clear it up here as well. Clear crypto like v2. Whoops. To make sure that I'm not caching something that's bogus. Oops. Say conf t. Yeah, payload. Ike auth exchange response. Payload contents encrypted. Authentication exchange failed. Or setting. All right, I'm going to pause this real quick and so that way you don't have to watch the troubleshooting. So give me a second here and let me see if I can sort this out. So let's hold on just one second. Okay, so <laughs> that was about a minute. You, you may have been screaming at the screen. If you see what I did, this is pretty embarrassing here. So when I did my tunnel interface configuration, so you can see I'm doing the debugs and it's still failing, right? Well, if you take a look here, if I do a, a show run interface tunnel zero, what is the IP address that I put on the tunnel interface for um, for a tunnel zero here on router two? 10, 10, 10, 2, right? What's a tunnel interface that I have down here? 
10, 10, 10, 2. So, and I haven't fixed this yet, but this is just something I, I stumbled upon. So let's say uh, interface tunnel 0. Let's fix the IP address 10, 10, 10, 4. And let's see if... We've got the correct interface on there. And let's see if that would be uh, one of the reasons. So I'm going to say clear crypto or yeah, clear crypto IP2SA. And let's see if the debug comes back with anything or if we're in the same boat. So that was definitely, let's see, show IP route. That was the first thing that I saw. 10, 10. And it doesn't even look as if that's getting put into the routing table show IP interface brief. So that was the first thing I saw. So it should be 10, 10, 10, 4, and it's up, down. Let's take a look over here. Show IP interface brief. Whoops, let's do you all. And 10, 10, 10, 2 is also up down so it looks like it maybe so that was the first thing I came across was that the IP address I was walking back through each of the configuration sections but it's clear that there's something that it doesn't like with all right so let me do this I'll take another quick pause here that way you don't have to uh, watch through me scrambling around here so I'll be right back okay we're back and again uh, I was just walking through the config and I'm pretty sure I've identified the issue and it is right here again keeping the IP addresses straight obviously critical so <laughs> nice to see that uh, that it turned out to be something simple I was again focused definitely on the um, the pre-shared key thinking that I had done something wrong there but you'll notice here on router 2, what is the tunnel destination? Well, I've got the first three octets right, but that last octet, uh, the dot 2, is not the, uh, the, the, the final octet. So it should be um, uh, 104054. So let's change that. Tunnel destination 10.40.50. Uh, dot four do show run in tu zero and now we've got the tunnel mode ipsec on there do show ip interface brief and uh, what happened was it was when i was i basically pulled uh the ipsec uh, profile protections off of both of the tunnel interfaces and then tried to ping end to end and it simply wasn't working at which point I'm like okay well that's just a simple GRE tunnel so it has to be something with either the source or destination uh, entries I have under the tunnel interface and sure enough uh, that was it so if I were to say do show so it shows up there so if I say do ping can I ping the other side of the tunnel now I can ping 10 10 10 4 can I ping myself I can from router 4, ping 10.10.10.4. I can ping myself, my tunnel interface. I can ping across the tunnel. So now we get down to uh, the validation. But before we do that, I'm going to say uh, debug Ike or crypto Ike v2. And what I want to do is I'm going to take this interface down because we want to see when it comes back up. Uh, we're going to say shut. So I'm going to shut the interface down. And this should look familiar, right? Deleting the SA, um, tearing everything down, and supplier parameter is incorrect. So now let's bring the interface back up and let's see what happens. Checking for duplicates. A supplied parameter is incorrect. So let's check to see. Information exchange. So let's do a clear crypto Ike v2 SA. No duplicate found. The interface came up. So the tunnel interface is up. So we're good there. 
So let's say you all. So yeah, I had to clear the uh, the association. It looked like something may have been cached there, telling us that it was getting bad info. All right, so let's go ahead do or um, show IP interface brief. We're going to run a couple commands here to make sure that things going through the tunnel are being encrypted. You'll notice that we have uh, loopback 10 addresses. Sorry, loopback 10, uh, which is 10, 10, 41. So we're going to set up OSPF across this tunnel interface as well. But first, let's go ahead and uh, see, can I ping? I was able to ping across. But if I were to go ahead and type in here, um, show crypto session detail, right? You can see that we've got no packets encrypted, no packets decrypted. Well, let's try to change that. So I'm going to say ping 10.10.10.4, repeat a few times, and then uh, from 10.10.10.2. All right, so we've got some packets coming across here. Let's see now. Yeah, certainly. Right, you can see that number. And the output, very similar to the output from the Ike v1 setup. Right? So the traffic is definitely being encrypted. And so if we wanted to do the same thing, I could simply come in here and say config t router OSPF. Or let's do, uh, let's see, we'll do router EIGRP 99. And I'm just going to say uh, network, and what are we at? That uh, we obviously want it on this interface. So 10.10.10.0, and we'll put it on 10.10.40.0. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, do show IP interface brief. So those are the two subnets, or the two interfaces on which we want to. Yep, 10. I'm sorry, 10.10.41 is loopback 10, and then the tunnel interface. So we'll say control shift six here. And um, let's go global config and say router EIGRP. And before we do that, let me double check the interfaces here. Let's make sure these IPs are correct. Do show IP interface brief. This is 101021. So router EIGRP 99, uh, network 10.10.20.0, and then network 10.10. 10.0. You see the adjacency popped up there across tunnel zero. So if I say do show IP EIGRP neighbors, right, you can see that my neighbor is 1010104. .10 and over here, do we have an adjacency? Do show IP EIGRP neighbors. Again, the static virtual tunnel interfaces, right, the multicast traffic for obviously EIGRP, the 224010. Uh, that traffic is going to make its way across without any issues, right? Uh, and even though we don't have GRE involved here, the static virtual tunnel interface uh, allows us to do this. If I say do show IP route, uh, you can see, let's see, do I have that in here? Let me say no auto, make sure we're not doing. And do show IP route. So I've got my adjacency up. And there is the EIGRP route for the 10.10.20. Let me make sure, do show IP route. And I'll bet you do show run section EIGRP. Having some issues with my, oh, there, okay. So it did the network 10.10.10.0. .10 .10 uh, And let me do this. I'm wondering why that's showing that. Got too many 10 dots, probably. Let's see here. So, do show IP route. I'm not seeing the route for 10.20.1. So, I can ping because it's going across the tunnel interface. It's learning it from EIGRP. So, that is working. Do show run section EI. GRP. And it's got the same thing. It just threw it on the 10. So why did it not pick up you show IP interface brief? 10, 10, 20. So it picked that one up, but it didn't pick up. Let me make sure. Do you show IP interface brief? 10, 10, 40.
So let me try this. Let me do network 10.10.40.1. .10 .40 section EIGRP to make it a little more specific and see if that was what the issue is. Do you show IP route? Yeah, and I'm still not picking that up. Huh. Do you show run section EIGRP? Let me see if it breaks it if I do it like this. 10, 10, 21. Let's see if it's picking it up here. Do show IP route. And it's actually not 20.1, sorry about that. It's 20.2. All right, did I put 40.1 over here? You show run. I did put 40.1, it's not 40.1, it's 40.2. Four. Do you show IP route? Yeah, it doesn't like it. Do you show IP route? Do you show IP interface free. Let me make sure I got the right IP. IPs or it is 40.1. Yeah, I've not a good uh, setup here on these addresses. So the loopback 10 is 10 10 40. One, do you show run section EIGRP? So we're going to say no, although that does not seem to be helping us. Even with the more specific advertisement, do clear. Actually, let me come up here and say show IP route. Not picking it up. So clear IP EIGRP neighbors. I think that's everything. All right, so the adjacency is being established, and that is up. Show IP route, but I'm not learning that route. Let's see what happened over here, and he is learning the route. All right, so this has got me scratching my head here. And this better not be another issue with the IP addresses. Um, so the advertisement is correct. Show IP. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 10.10. Aha. Uh -huh. So the 10.10.40. Is being picked up here so then why is 10 10 20 because there is no 10 10 20 okay so I'm learning about the 10 10 40 am I read because I'm redistributing hold on one second let me do a uh, show run uh, section BGP do show run section BGP all right it took me a second to figure it out so I'm redistributing yeah I don't have a route map locking down so I'm doing it up here. I have a route map. I'll bet you show run section BGP. Yeah, there it is right there. Okay, so the problem, which now it dawns on me, I'm learning about the 101040 via BGP. What's the administrative distance of BGP? The administrative distance is 20, which is less than 90, which is what the administrative distance of EIGRP is. So when I actually set up this uh, MPLS L3 VPN, I had constrained uh, the distribution of, so if I were to say show route map, uh, and then actually show prefix list, show IP prefix list, I think it is, show IP prefix list, there we go. So you can see I constrained the advertisement over here for the loopbacks, which are connected interfaces. I did not do that over here. So here's what will fix that, right? So the problem, so what's our problem? The problem is, is that I'm learning about this 10, 10, 40 uh, via BGP, which has a lower administrative distance than EIGRP. That's why the route is in the table. So all I need to do here is the same thing that I did on router two is I'm gonna create a, prefix list, so IP prefix list, and I'll just say PL um, sequence number one, 
permit. Uh, and I gotta be careful here because what am I trying to do? I'm gonna redistribute this out. So I'm gonna wanna redistribute the 10.40.50. And how did I, what did I say? I did the slash 30, yeah, slash 32. Uh, dot four slash 32. And then we're gonna basically do up a route map. So route map, and I'm just gonna say re, or distro, call it distro. Route map, distro, uh, permit 10, match IP address prefix list uh, PL and then that is it so then I need to go into router BGP and I can't remember the number so 65004 whoops 65004 and I'm gonna drop it on did I do the address families on here do show run section BGP and yep so address family IPv4 unicast the neighbor uh, or actually just redistribute sorry uh, redistribute um, make sure I get it correct here and we're looking at yeah connected redistribute connected route map and the route map is called distro all right so let me do a do clear IP BGP star on router 4 and let's see how quickly So the tunnel interface is down, but the tunnel interface will come back up. So if I do a show IP route now, you can see I don't have much in here. Because we're going to wait for BGP to come back up on router 4, so he'll reestablish his... do something in the route map I think I may have did something in that let me see show IP prefix list let's make sure I got this right so for some reason I put out the oh for my connected yep sorry about that so let's go ahead and say show IP interface brief I need the 1040 because over here we've got show IP interface brief and so I'm allowing the 102100 yes yeah, 102100 so this is going to be 104100 so I'm going to need that and I'm doing it as just a slash 24 so let me call that prefix list back up so show IP prefix list and so I'm going to say IP prefix list PL sequence 2 permit uh, 10.40.100.0 slash 24 and let's see now that I've dropped the do show IP prefix list so I've got the loop back and I've got the main Ethernet zero interface on here still not learning anything let's say do clear IP BGP star so things look good on router 4 and I am learning about the routes from router 2 and let's double check here show IP route so router 2 has lost everything all right, give me a second here. Show run section BGP. Redistribute connected route map R2 loop back BGP. Show route map. And I'm wondering what I broke on router 2. IP show IP interface brief so we went from having an administrative distance issue okay let's see if I can ping across to 10.40.50.2 and I probably can't because I have no route on the routing table to get there clear IP BGP, oops, BGP star 
and let's see, show IP route. So the adjacent show BGP, VPN, oh, so BGP, IPv4, unicast, all. And so now it looks like it's something with the MPLS layer 3 VPN. So we had it up and working and went to put EIGRP on there. Let me go ahead and do one last pause here, bring this back. Let me take a look at the MPLS uh, L3 VPN setup on the PE routers to make sure I'm not missing something here. And then we will wrap up. So I'll be right back. Okay, well, this was, a quick, <laughs> this was a quick one. I probably should have just used PL. So I put distro, and then here it says distro. So again, I apologize. Uh, let me go ahead, instead of tweaking the route map, I'm just going to go into router BGP 65, I think it's 004, uh, address family IPv4 unicast. And boy, I was the victim of the IP address mismatch today and the spelling mistake. Uh, mismatch today so we're gonna say no redistribute because right now I'm I have I'm referencing a route map that doesn't exist and it is blocking all of my redistribution uh, so let's get this right redistribute connected route map and it's D I T S T R O so I'm going to misspell that intentionally and you can see the tunnel actually came back up after I pulled the route map off. Now I'm doing the redistribution. You can see, look at the adjacency came back up. So let's take a look at the show IP route now. And we are still 10, 10, 40. We're still picking that up through EIGRP or through a BGP. So do show run section EIGRP. 101040 10, and it's not 1010 10, or it is 101041 10, 10, so let me make sure and there we go it sorted itself out so all right whoo man that was a long one so this was definitely a great video i like to call these the fortuitous failures where uh, you've got to kind of troubleshoot and uh, and basically go back through everything to make sure that you've got everything right so we've got eigrp running across the tunnel uh, can i ping 101041 10, I can over here on router four show IP route. Uh, I'm learning about the what is it 10 10 21. Can I ping 10.10.20.1? And again, it was as if those were uh, you know land segments hanging off behind this router, going over uh, this MPLS layer three VPN setup. All right, so definitely a long series of videos, but just to recap, we took a look at. IPsec, and let me pull that drawing back up. We took a look at IPsec in general, and then we broke it down. We looked at IKEV1, which we did on our right-hand side over here across the internet. We set up a security association IPsec point-to-point -point tunnel using a static virtual tunnel interface. We talked about the different phases, phase one and phase two. We talked about main mode, aggressive mode. Uh, there's three exchanges that take place. And then we talked about phase two, which is quick mode. We looked at some debugs. We also did the Ike v2 configuration. Uh, very important that your IP addresses are correct. If they are not, as we saw, you're going to run into some issues, right? Um, and then across both of these, I ran OSPF across the Ike v1 tunnel. I ran EIGRP across the Ike v2 tunnel. Um, and we talked about authentication header and then ESP, encapsulating security payload, uh, the strengths and weaknesses. And um, we talked a little bit about the differences between GRE over IPsec and IPsec over GRE. However, it's important to note the static virtual tunnel interface, it is IPsec. There is no GRE involved, right? And we saw that when we did a show in Tunnel Zero where we looked at the MTU, which was uh, 1500, so we weren't losing. Uh, anything in the tunnel due to the GRE encapsulation, specifically those 24 bytes. And again, we looked at the two different use cases. One, just going across dirty internet circuits, and the other going across a provider uh, MPLS Layer 3 VPN core looking for a little additional security. Okay, again, I apologize for uh, some of the troubleshooting in there, but it's always, always a good thing to make some mistakes and uh, they have to troubleshoot those mistakes to get a little better uh, uh, appreciation of the process as well as um, you know making you really double check things so 
But uh, hopefully this has you know enhanced your understanding of IPsec, uh, as well as IKE v1 and IKE v2 from both a theory and a practical implementation perspective. Uh, and again, when we talk about some of the uh, the differences or the benefits of IKE v2 over IKE v1, um, we've got some. So, <clears throat> excuse me, some enhancements, right? So Ike V2 doesn't consume, uh, you know, all things being equal, doesn't consume as much bandwidth as Ike V1. There's fewer packets that, that are exchanged. Ike V2, right, um, has built-in support for uh, NAT traversal. Ike V1 does not. Um, Ike V2 uh, also supports uh, the extensible authentication protocol, right? So EEP. And you can actually do uh, your authentication of the peers, the peer routers, uh, using uh, the EAP setup, right? Um, and then finally, uh, the Ike V2, there's one more thing. It's not the NAT. I talked about the NAT and the bandwidth. Uh, the Keep Alive. So with Ike V1, you can set Keep Alives uh, to check to make sure that the tunnel is up and alive. With Ike V2, that is done automatically for you uh, it, where it will check to make sure that the tunnel is still alive, which is something that Ike V2, you actually have to configure the Keep Alives to do that. All right, well, thank you so much for watching. I hope that this has uh, enhanced your understanding. I'm going to go ahead and do a follow on video here uh, where we use crypto maps and where we would be talking about G GRE over IPsec versus IPsec over GRE. And again, this has been the static virtual tunnel interface uh, configuration methodology. All right, thanks for watching and have a great weekend.